good morning honorable visitors and welcome my name is shikha vyas durga prasad i feel really privileged to have the opportunity to work as a program director for this esteemed event let me start by expressing gratitude and appreciation for the opportunity i am honored to see so many distinguished people here today who represent the best in the public and private <coughs> sectors as well as in the government businesses and academic organizations these prominent guests are the top professionals in their respective fields and possess in depth expertise that is important for knowledge transfer through distinguished lecture on behalf of the school of public management governance and public policy that is established in the college of business and economics at the university of johannesburg i take privilege to welcome our distinguished guest mr laseja khaniago governor of the south african reserve bank members of the executive leadership group university of johannesburg mrs nolwazi momorare chief financial officer university of johannesburg professor lungile and sazal laze executive dean of the college uh, of business and economics vice deans and directors of schools in the college of business and economics deans and vice deans of various faculties university of johannesburg eminent stakeholders established practitioners academic students and colleagues to this prestigious occasion let's give this outstanding guest a round of applause so what is a distinguished lecture it is an event a forum it is an opportunity that experts can share knowledge with students and academic faculties about their expertise and experience to bridge the gap between theory and practice this forum is crucial prominent speakers at the event are seasoned professionals in their fields of specialization and help to close implementation gaps in policies and programs and why do we need distinguished lectures it is an opportunity to welcome speakers of the great caliber from the business academic and industrial sectors to offer their insights on current affairs and share their visions for the future and for the school of public management governance and public policy and college of business and economics it serves the aim to pursue new knowledge to improve public service delivery to individuals and communities and empower citizens through these services to maximize development potential to prepare our students and staff to become future fit leaders and responsible global citizens we invite high caliber experts and prominent practitioners to provide distinguished lectures on topical public governance issues the intent is to motivate students and the academic fraternity by allowing them to glimpse inside the thought processes of exceptional and successful leaders executives innovators and entrepreneurs The objective of distinguished lecture is to share lessons learned and offer insight into our often challenging working settings in the private and public sectors. Discussions concerning topics like the global economy and linking it to the domestic status quo, which is the theme of today's distinguished lecture, and then linking to the practical application of academic theory. are beneficial for students as well as the wider academic community the distinguished lecture format includes a presentation subsequently followed by questions and answers however occasionally the speaker may just share anecdotes from his or her experiences before opening the floor to questions from the audience well this is the format of today's event 
Our distinguished guest will deliver his experiences through his presentation, followed by a question and answer session. I start this event by inviting Mrs. Nolwazi Mamorare, Chief Financial Officer, University of Johannesburg, to offer some significant insights regarding the happenings within the university with some success stories. Mrs. Mamurare is a Chief Financial Officer of the University of Johannesburg, a role she has held since May 2018. Having joined the university in 2014, she previously held the role of Executive Director responsible for financial governance and revenue. She is a chartered accountant, graduated from Rhodes University and the University of KwaZulu-Natal. She has held senior executive roles in a range of public and private sector organizations. During her career, Mrs. Mamurari has led one of the largest programs of significant regulatory reform in financial reporting and assurance for the higher education sector. While at the Auditor General of South Africa, she led and successfully completed the alignment of auditing and financial reporting for public higher education institutions in South Africa to the Public Audit Act requirements. This involved extensive engagements with the vice chancellors and principals of the institutions, the National Department of Higher Education and Training, and auditors in the sector, developing a framework to promote reporting that enables improved accountability by the institutions. Her passion for education and its impact in society is long-standing. She previously served as a SICA accredited training officer and in her current role as Chief Financial Officer of University of Johannesburg has rewarded the institutional fundraising efforts, raising more than around 2 billion in scholarship and research funding for the university over the past five years. I invite Mrs. Mamurare to offer opening remarks on behalf of the University of Johannesburg leadership. Thank you, Shika, and good morning, everybody. That CV did not sound like me, but we welcome giving to the University of Johannesburg. We exist to ensure that um, the communities within South Africa are able to get the skills, and without contribution from all of you, we wouldn't be able to do that. Good morning once again. Good morning. Good morning, good morning. <laughs> Starting with um, an ad break. <laughs> um, the, the former minister of um, the United Kingdom, um, David Cameron, once declared that the economy is the start and end of everything. Um, to me, this suggests that our well-being can be determined by our economic context. As we emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic, the recovery has been um, quite patchy. Um, there's little consensus, for instance, um, as to whether the, um, the globe, the country, is on the verge of a global recession or not. Just last month, the International Monetary Fund warned that the outlook remains uncertain. Um, in um, its report, um, and I quote directly from the report, it indicated that on the surface, the global economy appears poised for a gradual recovery from the powerful blows of the pandemic and of Russia's war in Ukraine. Below the surface, however, turbulence is building and the situation is quite fragile. <coughs> and in April, the World Bank warned that the global economy is in danger of suffering a lost decade of growth. Its um, chief, um, deputy chief economist, economist Ian Costa said, the golden era of development appears to be coming to an end. Um, with the bank warning that the shocks in recent years were said to create lasting damage to economic performance undermining the efforts to improve global living standards, reduce poverty, and address climate change. 
In fact, these setbacks have had more lasting effects and are expected to reduce growth rates this decade by a third compared with the last, um, with the first 10 years of this century. Um, and of course, South Africa is not spared. Um, our own prognosis of the economic risks indicate stagnation um, with um, shrinking um, GDP and um, the impacts of the blackouts. Um, and um, of course, alongside with our own challenges, we are not sheltered from the global context and uncertainty that, that prevails. As a public university, at the southern end of Africa, UJ does not exist in a vacuum. We exist in an environment that is marred by all of these challenges. Um, and I must say that these challenges are increasing in extent and in, in complexity. We have, however, performed remarkably well um, over the past years, as demonstrated by various rankings that show that the university um, is not only um, increasing its positioning in the rankings, but we have societal impact. We have been quite intentional about this, and we have been quite intentional about the impact we have in closing the gap caused by the economic divide. We provide um, funded access to world-class learning facilities, um, and um, research tools to the poorest of our communities. I think this is demonstrated um, by um, at least 30% of our schools that we take from the poorest of our communities. Um, it is, however, said that we're finding that um, as we are not insulated from the global, the local, um, and the general stresses onto, onto the economy, we are finding ourselves um, facing the threat to our ability to be able to continue to play this role in society. And ladies and gentlemen, it's against this grim context um, that we joined up by um, the Governor of the Reserve Bank um, to dissect these challenges um, and um, to perhaps maybe shed some light and give us the tools um, that could assist us in navigating this Unseen times um, in the past, I think um, being um, chief financial officers of um, universities um, is um, becoming quite a challenging role. Um, we often are required to perform magic by balancing numbers that do not balance. <laughs> um, but um, we are surrounded by communities that are quite resilient that always hit our call um, when we ask that we tighten the belt. But the belt can be tightened only for so long. So we do need different ways and means in which um, we can navigate the terrain and ensure that we continue to be sustainable and play the significant role that we are required to. I thank you very much. Thanks for thank today. Thank you, Mrs. Mamurare. Well, the success stories continue. I invite Professor Lingule Ancelazi, Executive Dean of the College of Business and Economics, to share the insights regarding the vision and mission of the college. Professor Lingule Ancelazi is the Executive <coughs> Dean of the College of Business and Economics here at University of Johannesburg. Prior to joining University of Johannesburg in 2021, he was executive dean of the College of Accounting Sciences at the University of South Africa. He is a chartered accountant with over 14 years of post articles working experience in industry and academia, and a winner of the 2021 Saika Honors TIA Award, a prestigious recognition of this exceptional work and contribution to the field of accountancy. Professor Anzalaze completed a PhD in Development Finance Studies from the University of Stellenbosch. He also holds membership status as a Chartered Development Finance Analyst. His research interests include household over indebtedness and multidimensional poverty. I invite Professor Lungile Anzalaze to offer introductory remarks on behalf of the College of Business and Economics. Uh, 
thank you, Prof. Chika, for, for that introduction. And to our Madam CFO, uh, thank you so much. You delivered a very insightful uh, address as an opening for this occasion. To our special guest, uh, Honorable Ndade Lesija Kanyako, the Governor of the Reserve Bank of South Africa, uh, the leadership of the university represented here by our Madam CFO, the College of Business and Economics, its leadership, its staff members, students, I want to make a special mention of the School of Public Management, Governance and Public Policy under the leadership of Professor Dominique Wizemana. Our friends and colleagues as the college from within the university and from outside the university, I saw a few colleagues uh, the principal of the National School of Government, Professor Usani Naweni, distinguished guests, good morning, Molweni. Good morning. So, as I start what is named as an introduction, uh, introductory remarks to 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 the main speech by the governor, I just want to share about an experience in my previous life. I assisted in construction as Udaga boy. Can some of us relate to Udaga boy? Okay, I'm happy to, to see some heads nodding. And those that cannot relate, I'm sure after the event we can talk about what does it mean to be Udaga boy. So one would mix sand and cement, mix them thoroughly so that there is uniformity in the mixture. And before you put in water, you open space in the middle while the mixture is building walls around the center. And then as you pour water, you are slowly transferring the mixture from outside into the center. So, the interesting thing I want to draw attention to is, as you do that, then crisis starts. And how does this manifest? The water breaks through the walls. And as you attend to one breakpoint, several other breakpoints emerge. And you find yourself in a crisis that will only conclude once the mixture is fully put together. So ladies and gentlemen, this memory frequently visits me these days. And I think it mirrors exactly what is happening around us and worldwide. Without even breathing a sigh of relief after surviving the peak of COVID, the Russia-Ukraine conflict started and its effect on energy and food prices is driving up global inflation. The energy crisis is a re reality the food crisis is a reality. The cost of living crisis can quickly turn into a broader humanitarian crisis that is likely to, <clears throat> to fuel social unrest in our communities across the world because survival needs like food, you cannot postpone them. We need to deal with them as they present themselves. We need to eat every day, for instance. Well, one can manage fighting one issue, but what happens now when you are facing multiple issues happening at the same time, which is what I think 
is happening. It seems like we have entered as the world into a cycle of multiple crises that are happening at once, so interconnected that their overall impact far exceeds the sum of their individual impacts. The world is filled with hopelessness and perhaps resembles the state of despair which one of the prophets, Ezekiel, saw in the vision about, about his nation. Bones, dry bones, loosely, loosely scattered everywhere. And I think the question that was asked then, can these bones live again, is a question that is still relevant for, lo for all of us, even to this day. Is there something on the horizon that can bring hope and make life better for us? At the College of Business and Economics, we are committed to improving the world through education, through research and innovation. In our qualifications, our programs, many of which are highly ranked both locally and internationally, we train future leaders that are equipped to leverage emerging digital technologies for societal impact. Our CFO touched on that. And I'm confident that many stakeholders that have joined us today can attest to the fact that our graduates are the best our graduates have the right skills and are ready to contribute to our economy. But our greatest challenge, ladies and gentlemen, is the rising outstanding student debt. Education fees have been rising above consumer inflation. And the current crisis is leading our students to, reg to cancel their registrations. And we cannot afford to watch that happen because declining investment in human development will definitely erode our future resilience. And it means a lot to us for you to be here and educate the nation about the challenges that we are facing as a nation and global challenges so that we can anticipate what is to come and respond accordingly. As I sit down, I'm just curious about a few things, about how you describe the situation that we're in first, and whether do you see any signs of stagflation? Our CFO uh, mentioned recession. <clears throat> we don't know. But given the unprecedented interaction of negative economic indicators with high levels of debt, I'm sure many of us in this room would be interested to hear what you have to say to us and how we should react to the current challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lungile Antlaze. And now, it's time to experience the moment whereby our distinguished guest, Mr. Laseja Khanyago, Governor of the South African Reserve Bank, is going to present some insightful information on happenings in the country with a wider macro level perspective. Mr. Khanyago was appointed Governor of the South African Reserve Bank with effect from 9 November 2014. He was reappointed by the President of South Africa for a second five-year term, effective 9 November 2019. He is the chairperson of the Monetary Policy Committee and the Financial Stability Committee. Prior to his appointment as governor, Mr. Kanyago served as Deputy Governor of the South African Reserve Bank from 16 May 2011 until his elevation to governor. Mr. Khanyago chairs the Committee of Central Bank Governors of the Southern African Development Community, co-chairs 
the Financial Stability Board's Regional Consultative Group for Sub-Saharan Africa, and chairs the Financial Stability Board's Standing Committee on Standards Implementation. In addition, he served as a chairperson of the Internationally Monetary and Financial Committee, which is the primary advisory board to the International Monetary Fund Board of Directors from 18 January 2018 till 17 January 2021. Before joining the South African Reserve Bank, Mr. Khaniago was the Director General of the National Treasury. He represented South Africa at international organizations such as the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, the G20, and the African Development Bank. In this role, he served as a chair of the Development Committee deputies and co-chaired a G20 working group on the reform of the International Monetary Fund. He holds an MSc in Economics from SOS University of London and a Bachelor of Commerce degree in Economics and Accounting from the University of South Africa. It is with honor that I invite Mr. Lesecha Khaniago, who is going to speak on a cutting edge topic, exploring the challenges facing the global economy from a South African perspective. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Program Director, and all professors observed. Um, <laughs> I have got a height problem. Um, and good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure for me to uh, address you here at the University of Johannesburg today. The past few years, have been a roller coaster, evidenced by the numerous shocks that we have been faced with in a space of just three years. While the global economy at large continues to recover from COVID-19 shock, and as we navigate what we consider a new normal, there are important challenges that we continue to face as policymakers across the world. As such, the topic chosen for my address today, challenges facing the global economy from a South African perspective, could not be more fitting. This topic is particularly important for South Africa, which alongside other emerging market economies has had its own idiosyncratic challenges being exacerbated by these global shocks. In light of this background, my speech today will focus on how inflation, growth, and the monetary policy outlook have impacted our domestic economy. Before doing so, it is probably important that we do a quick recap of where we have come from. The major disruptions since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic have been an important learning exercise for global economic policy. With no precedent in a recent history to learn from, it has highlighted the importance of finding appropriate responses required to address the shock. The unusually large supply and demand imbalances we witnessed during and post the pandemic were a result of sudden restrictions and consequent relaxation of economic activity as authorities around the world sought to contain the spread of the pandemic. You will remember that prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, global inflation was quite low, with many major central banks struggling to get inflation up to 2% target. Soon after the pandemic hit, Broad-based deadlines in inflation followed, which then in response indeed induced, which in response induced a wave of fiscal and monetary policy stimulus. The South African Reserve Bank itself reduced its repurchase rate or the repo rate 
to an all-time low of 3.5% in July 2020. This stimulus, provided by policymakers to mitigate the impacts of the pandemic, together with pent-up demand from the COVID-19 restrictions, and the much slower reopening of the services sector boosted the demand for goods while supply remained constrained. This, in turn, fueled what would eventually be the highest rate of global inflation in a generation. As the global economy was uh, gradually recovering from the COVID-19 shock, another unexpected shock came early last year. Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which triggered a war that still rages on today. The war in the Ukraine compounded the shock to the prices of oil, gas, and some inputs into food production, such as fertilizers, further fueling the global inflation problem. With the benefit of hindsight, we now know that the various stimulus efforts by policymakers contributed to the inflation problem we are currently sitting, uh, sitting with. Nonetheless, the stimulus was much needed and supported demand conditions at a time when consumer confidence had been crushed by the lockdowns and the fellows. However, it is now clear that fiscal and monetary policy remained too loose for far too long. The ultra-low interest rates and generous transfers to households and businesses created excess demand. In an environment where supply constraints have lowered potential output in most economies, which in turn ignited the inflation problem we currently face. Subsequently, global inflation pressures have resulted in many central banks around the world embarking on unusually fast and synchronized monetary policy normalization. The South African Reserve Bank itself implemented a series of 75 basis points hikes over the past year, faster than in prior tightening cycles. Since November 2021 to date, we have increased the repo rate by a cumulative 425 basis points. However, for context, the cumulative repo rate increases by the sub have been below those implemented by some of our emerging market peers. And more importantly, the real repo rate is still below its estimated neutral of 2.5%. Where are we now? Well, it is encouraging to see that some of the shocks that drove the surge in global inflation have begun to ease. After, speaking, after peaking around the middle of 2022, global inflation moderated somewhat in the fourth quarter of 2022 and into the first quarter of 2023. However, Although these developments have overall been positive for many economies, in, for many economies, inflation still remains elevated and well above central bank targets. Importantly, inflation is showing signs of persistence in several sectors. The latest International Monetary Fund's World Economic Outlook projects global inflation at 7% this year, down from the 2022 20, average of 8.7%. Inflation is expected to further moderate to 4.9% in 2024. This decreasing trend is reflective of lower food and commodity prices, particularly oil, coupled with the gradual unwinding of supply constraints. Although demand pressures have begun 
easing somewhat in response to global monetary and fiscal policy normalization, core inflation remains high and persistent, risking prolonged target breaches in most economies, which could lead to some de-anchoring of inflation expectations. Furthermore, the global growth outlook remains weak. Following the steady recovery in trading partner growth in 2021 at 7%, growth slowed to an estimated 3.5% last year. Looking ahead and in line with higher prevailing interest rates, the SAP expects trading partner growth to average 2% this year, before rising gradually to 2.6% in 2024 and 3.1% in 2025. In addition to slow growth, rising interest rates have also triggered banking sector stresses in the United States and Europe, leading to tighter global credit conditions as markets and financial institutions readjust their portfolios. Consequently, Uncertainty around the path for the U.S. Federal Reserve's Fed funds rate has increased over the near term. This has added to financial market volatility and the resulting risk of sentiment is impacting small open economies such as South Africa. These bank stresses have also added to global policy uncertainty as the size and duration of these effects are still playing out, as can be seen in the recent failure of First Republic Bank at the beginning of May 2023. When I mentioned earlier some of the positive global developments over recent months, one of them has been a reduction in delivery lags and supply bottlenecks, which have contributed favorably to the inflation dynamics of some countries. Unfortunately, this has yet to have a material impact on our domestic inflation, mainly due to idiosyncratic domestic factors. In fact, it is expected that our own domestic infrastructural bottlenecks will continue to exert upside pressure on the inflation outlook. In addition to the initial st studies on the impact of load shedding on growth, there is recognition and growing evidence that the country's ongoing energy supply challenges are impacting on prices as well. The SAP now estimates that load shedding will add 0.5 percentage points to the headline inflation in 2023. This calculation has taken into account the cost of alternative energy sources such as solar or backup power generators, costs which are assumed will likely be passed on to consumers. Overall, South Africa is no different from most countries that have experienced a surge in price pressures. With our economy being an, an open economy, global price pressures were bound to, sooner or later, reach our shores. Higher global food and oil prices and more generally elevated global goods inflation translated to inflationary pressures in the domestic economy partly transmitted via the weaker rent, a point I will revisit later. This pushed domestic headline inflation to a high of 7.8% in July 2022, a rate that was last reached almost 14 years ago. Parallel to the somewhat easing global price pressures, Domestic headline inflation has gradually slowed and came in at 7.1% in March 2023. However, despite this moderation, primarily driven by a deadline in fuel prices from the peaks observed in mid-2022, inflation 
remains well above the sub's preferred midpoint of 3 to 6% target range. Inflation edged slightly higher in February and January and March after recording 6.9% in January. Underpinned in the main by rising food and core inflation. Nevertheless, we expect a return to the 4.5% midpoint, though only by the third quarter of 2025. In South Africa, food inflation has continued to surprise to the upside, despite the decelerating trend observed in global agricultural commodities. Domestic meat inflation remains elevated, reflective of lingering domestic supply constraints in the beef market after the outbreak of food and mouth disease last year. The expectation is for market conditions to improve gradually over the near term. However, the ongoing electricity supply challenge is likely to have more of an impact on energy sensitive markets such as poultry and dairy farming. Another important factor that has impacted inflation in South, Af in South, African, in South Africa has been exchange rate weakness. The rent has been one of the worst performing emerging market currencies this year and over the past 12 months. Idiosyncratic factors such as persistent load shedding and the recent grey listing of the country by the Financial Action Task Force have kept, away, have kept investors wary. And by extension, the rent depreciation has negated the impact of lower global energy and food costs on domestic inflation. Of concern is that core inflation, which excludes the more volatile food and energy components from the consumer price index basket, remains sticky. The pressure on core inflation has been mainly driven by repriced imported goods uh, 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 costs. But apart from higher imported goods, goods costs, one needs to keep an eye on core services inflation. To date, services inflation has remained relatively subdued, averaging around 3.9% in 2022. We have, however, seen upside risks, especially in medical insurance as premiums move closer towards their longer-term average rates. In addition to this, the tightening rental housing market and higher inflation expectations are expected to exert upside pressure on core inflation over the near term. Risks to services inflation also emanate from spillover effects from higher food and fuel inflation as well as possible higher wage increases given the adaptive nature of wage settlements in our economy. We have already seen sharply higher wage settlements in the public sector. We predict that core inflation will only decline to the target midpoint in the second quarter of 2025. Inflation has important distributional consequences with the poor and those living on fixed incomes the most adversely affected by rising inflation. The current inflation surge has been underpinned by high food and fuel price increases that more adversely affect the consumption baskets of poorer households. Statistics South Africa has South Africa, Statistics South Africa data show inflation for the lowest expenditure deciles, that is deciles one and two, at about 11% in March 23, 2023, while that for the expenditure deciles nine to 10 is around 6.5%. Unlike high income South Africans, low income earners and the poor more generally cannot protect their incomes 
from erosion due to inflation. And this results in rising income inequality in our country. This is a critical reason for the sub's constitutional mandate to protect the purchasing power of the rent, as this mandate ensures that we can continue to work towards improving and advancing the economic well-being of all South Africans. Looking ahead, domestic headline inflation is projected to remain elevated returning to the target range in the third quarter of this year and averaging 6% for this year. A more pronounced moderation in inflationary pressures is only expected in the latter years of the forecast horizon, with headline inflation projected to average 4.9% in 2024 before reaching the midpoint of the target range only in 2025. Well, what does this mean for growth? The SAP, like many other central banks elsewhere in the world, has to deal with the task of maintaining price stability. In South Africa, we protect the value of the currency in the interest of balanced and sustainable growth as stated in our constitutionally enshrined mandate. The challenging part now is that we must do this in a context where many of the drivers of both inflation and growth are outside of our control. Central banks have a very constrained policy toolkit to steer growth and can only effectively smooth business cycle fluctuations. By design, central banks are not capacitated to influence the long-run growth trajectory for the economy, as the decisions needed require governments to make trade-offs that entail winners and losers. Good decisions, of course, generate growth, making it possible for governments to compensate losers, both as the economy itself gets much larger, but also through direct transfers where required. Fighting inflation is much harder when the economy is already underperforming, as tighter financial conditions have the effect of cooling economic activity more broadly. Yet, if allowed to persist, high inflation will either fatally, fatally undermine the economy's growth potential or raise the near-term cost of eventually bringing inflation back to target. As we have often said, the prevailing conditions more than ever before have brought the monetary policy uh, conundrum to the fore. For instance, World growth is expected to be lower this year as the lagged impact of policy tightening weighs on real incomes and dampens demand. Demand for South African exports is likely to be weaker and this could be exacerbated by a decreasing trend in commodity prices which had previously helped mitigate what otherwise which have been a much more dire fiscal situation over the past two or so years. Together with increased alternative energy imports, this means that our terms of trade will deteriorate further. Following the robust growth rate of 4.9% recorded in 2021, the domestic economy showed sl slowed sharply to 2% in 2022. The SAP now forecasts growth of 0.2% this year and to average 1% in the following two years. This is barely an expansion. In fact, this is a reflection of the headwinds that the domestic economy continues to face. The ongoing infrastructure challenges especially for electricity, continue to impose a hard constraint on growth. The SAP estimates that load shedding alone will reduce GDP growth by 2% this year, 
after knocking off 0.7% from growth in the previous year. We trust that the government will remain committed to implementing structural reform measures, especially with regard to logistics and electricity. We believe that the implementation of much needed structural reforms will unlock South Africa's growth potential and in turn address the long-standing unemployment challenges of our country. In conclusion, it is safe to say that the past few years have presented a new set of challenges for macroeconomic policy makers across the globe. Although the demand and supply mismatches were witnessed at the peak of the pandemic and when the Russia-Ukraine war broke out last year have eased significantly, imbalances continue to linger and risks remain elevated. Despite the decelerating inflation trend over recent months, inflation remains above target in, major, in many jurisdictions with core inflation showing signs of persistence. This is despite sharp policy tightening by monetary policy authorities across the globe. South Africa's experience has paralleled that of the global economy with high inflation and slowing growth. However, domestic idiosyncrasies have played an outsized role in these developments over the past year, suggesting that we could have had somewhat lower inflation and stronger growth had structural policy settings been more favorable. Put differently, we are suffering from largely self-inflicted wounds. With headline inflation having remained above the target midpoint for an extended period, the, South, the SAMS Monetary Policy Committee has had to act decisively to prevent in, ex, inflation expectations from de-anchoring more permanently. Over the past 18 months, the repo rate has been raised by a cumulative 425 basis points and now sits at 7.75%. Still, the real policy rate remains somewhat accommodative being slightly below the estimated neutral rate of 2.5%. As we have reiterated before, we are constantly monitoring price developments and stand to act as necessary to fulfill our mandate. As an independent central bank operating a flexible inflation targeting framework, the sub's primary goal is to guide inflation and inflation expectations closer to the midpoint of the target band. I believe that many of us here understand that low and stable inflation is a prerequisite for a conducive business environment and in turn for inclusive and sustainable economic growth. We remain committed to do what we can within the context of our mandate to continue to make the livelihoods of South Africans better. This concludes my address. The University of Johannesburg, the future reimagined.